welcome everyone to the Parallax in the Classroom College and Beyond webinar. Uh, my name is Andy Lindsay and I'm uh, an educational applications engineer for Parallax going on 20 years. Uh, with me today is Kate Hay. She's our STEM educator and your co-host. And I almost said also Stephanie is with us, but she is on another webinar that I'll tell you about a little bit later in the, uh, in the, um, in the webinar. Uh, let's see here. So a little bit about the Zoom environment that you're in. Down at the bottom of your screen should be um, some, some options, uh, for example, raise hand and uh, Q&A. And then um, I'm not sure if it's being obscured by my slideshow software, but uh, there's a um, chat uh, button. And the chat button is really important. I would recommend that um, everybody who's here go ahead and open up their, uh, their chat. So for example, um, let's see, I believe mine is now open. And um, if anybody is having difficulty uh, with the, the chat functionality or opening the chat window, um, go ahead and message or um, raise your hand and Kate may be able to, <laughs> using the raise hand button and Kate may be able to help you out. Um, okay, so uh, what I'd like to do next are the, um, oh, I'm sorry. So the, uh, the way this particular webinar is going to work is I thought it would be kind of interesting to take the um, community college roundtable meetings where um, uh, normally, um, or where many departments, uh, they end up inviting various employers of their students and uh, the people, some of the people who work directly with them, hiring managers, um, and, and other people that are related to, uh, well, basically customers of the community college students. They invite them for um, an industry roundtable and they all get around and talk. And, and uh, to begin with the, uh, the um, uh, to begin with, there's usually a um, introductions and after the introductions, we, uh, end up um, talking about an update about what's going on with the school. For example, if there are new classes or new labs that pertain to um, some of the industry or public sector's needs. Um, after that part, then uh, we go around the room and talk with uh, all the folks who are visiting from industry and they say, okay, well, you know, this is working well. Uh, you know, your, your graduates are doing all this perfectly, um, but we have a new and emerging need over here. And so possibly if you could add a class that's related to this or a lab that's related to that, uh, that might um, address that new emerging need. And um, oh, by the way, let's also uh, do, you know, give some more attention to, uh, and then insert name of topic here. And so, uh, so that's um, something that a lot of community colleges do, inviting industry in. And so what I thought uh, would be nice today is to do that in reverse. So we uh, have our community college panel and uh, many um, college instructors who are attending the webinar. And uh, so what we'll do is reverse that. Uh, so what, um, after some introductions, I'll go ahead and talk about, okay, here's the resources that we have available to you for use in the classroom. And, uh, and then our question for you is going to be uh, what, what's working well, uh, what isn't working well, um, uh, and are there any things that we could potentially add to our offering that would make um, your job either easier or more effective? Sound good? Sounds good. Okay, so uh, so I'd like to start by introducing um, our three panelists today, uh, beginning with Jordan Meyer, and I'm trying to get to my notes for that slide. Pardon me a second. And zoom out. Okay, so um, 
So Jordan Meyer is, um, since 2015, he's been a professor at American River College, uh, teaching introductory electronics, radio communication, and robotics. Um, he got both his bachelor's and master's in mechanical engineering from UC San Diego uh, in 2004 and 2006, respectively. Uh, after uh, he graduated, he spent some time in industry, uh, starting with uh, designing test and automation machines for a company called Sith Systems. Uh, after four years of that, he went to Lawrence Livermore Laboratories, uh, where he worked uh, for another four years um, on the ignition facility. And if I remember rightly, it had to do with uh, robotically controlled ignitions. Um, is that right, Jordan? Yeah, the, the purpose of the National Ignition Facility is to create fusion in a laboratory environment. So it's a, it's a big project. And the part of it that I was working on was um, robotic systems that would um, repair and maintain some of the optics that were used in the laser paths. Okay, man, that sounds pretty intense. Um, it was a so, lot of fun. Yeah, it sounds like. And uh, then after a brief period at Ag Agilent, you started at American River College and have been there ever since. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Oh, wow. Okay, so a um, couple of questions for you. First of all, uh, how did you get started with microcontrollers? Well, it's funny. Actually, the basic stamp was the first microcontroller I ever got to program. So it was back in about 2003, I was a, a senior studying mechanical engineering at UCSD and there was a robotic design competition where um, teams of senior students would get together and design their own robots and then program a basic stamp to make the robots follow a course and collect little marbles and then deposit them in a chute at the end. So that was my first introduction to microcontrollers. And it was a lot of fun. I loved it. Yeah, it's uh, similar to mine. I actually started with a, a basic stamp too. <laughs> uh, and um, it was kind of different since I was in the electronics side. Mm -hmm. um, now, what courses do you teach uh, currently that are using microcontrollers? I teach um, robotics and I teach introductory electronics and we use microcontrollers in both of those classes. Okay, uh, so um, do, do, do the microcontrollers differ between the intro and the robotics? Yeah, so in the in the introductory electronics class we use the basic stamp and the students program it in PBASIC and then in the robotics class we use the propeller board, the propeller activity board and the students program that in Blockly Prop. Okay, uh, that's kind of an interesting pro progression of, uh, well, they get the multi-core in, in Blockly Prop, which is pretty nice. And um, I'm guessing that also, uh, since it's a robotics course, um, it's better not to put the onus of learning a brand new language onto the students. And so Blockly fits in well in that respect, would you? Right, right. So the, the robotics course has no prerequisites. So um, people can take that course having had no experience in electronics or programming or anything else um, related to robotics before. So we wanted to give them a, a language that was really easy to learn and, and get familiar with while at the same time having you know, the, the capabilities that are found in other programming languages and the same ideas um, so that's why we chose Blockly Prop for that. Oh, that makes sense. Okay, well, uh, thank you, Jordan. We're going to get back to you in a little bit after the other introductions uh, with a set of questions regarding the roundtable. Okay. All thanks. right. So next up, we uh, have Cindy, who is a professor at Trinidad State Junior College in Trinidad, Colorado. Um, she's the affiliate director at... Um, Trinidad State for the Colorado Space Grant Consortium. Um, she's also running the robotics program as part of the Space Grant Consortium and has been using uh, Parallax uh, from the beginning of that, so since 2009. Um, uh, her team has done remarkably well. Uh, they've gotten the best robot um, award from 2009 to 2016. And this is in a contest that uh, 
uh, is roughly currently half community colleges and half universities. So, um, so as a community college, her students have really excelled. And uh, let's see here, Let me. I'm checking my notes. 2009 and 10 was the basic stamp two. Uh, 2011 was the first time with the propeller and spin. And then from then on, uh, it was Propeller C through 2014. Uh, it was kind of cool. I actually did the Propeller C rollout and Cindy's team had been beta testing it. And um, literally a couple of days before we did the announcement of Propeller C, she sent me a link to an article that uh, her group uh, got the best robot award. And so I was able to add that to the little opening slideshow, which was kind of nice. Um, more recently, um, her team has been invited to the jo Johnson Space Center uh, Mars Yard to test their rover, and then this year to uh, the Mars Desert Research Station in Hanksville, Utah. Uh, Cindy has her bachelor's from Cal Poly and her master's from Oklahoma State in mathematics and has been teaching since 1982 in a variety of courses, including math, computer science, statistics, and uh, also at all levels from high school through university. Uh, hello, Cindy. Hi there. Uh, so same question for you. How did you get started with microcontrollers? I was volunteered to, to run the robotics team, <laughs> yes, in 2009, and I got to go th to a little workshop where the basic stamp was what they introduced the little Bobots with, so okay. that's what I started with, um, and then I used all your educational material to teach computer science P-Basic, and we built our first robot and had a great success at the Sand Dunes that first year. And then we have been building since then. Um, when you rolled out spin, we decided to go with that one. And then when we, when you rolled out prop C, we went to that one and we haven't really turned back since it enables us to run all of our sensors and all of our compasses and beacon programs and everything and not have to do interrupts or start stops or anything like that. Yeah, that's true since the propeller can uh, essentially be waiting for one sensor while it's doing some other process in another core. Yes, only one of our robots, I think it was last year's robot, we needed two propeller chips because we had so much going on. Yeah, so we so needed I I had... 16 little brains. Oh, wow. And you used all 16? Oh, yeah. <laughs> that, was gonna... that was, that was, that so this is Scouty from Hanksville, Utah this year. Okay. And, and is that the inside of Scouty? That is the platform of Scouty. We took a picture of it today since we didn't have any pictures of the platform without its top. Okay. Is that a propeller chip right in yes, the middle? Yes, that is a the... propeller chip. The okay, students so... designed their own electronics boards now. Oh, that's cool. And so they just plug the propeller dip chip right into it. Right. Okay. And then there's a closer up and I see the claw and battery pack. And this yes. is where you went this year? Yes, this is Hanksville, Utah. Okay. It's the Mars Desert Research Station. That's last year in Utah and in Houston, that's the Mars yard. Okay. Wow, that is really cool. All right, so, um, and then let's see. So what, so, so you've used the basic stamp and the propeller and you started then with P-Basic, did spin for a little while, and have since been doing Propeller C. Um, what I, still other... <clears throat> I still teach the P-Basic. They do an intro course in P-Basic, and then they do a Prop C language course for their higher language. Okay, before they, before they start programming the robot, I'm assuming. Yes, uh-huh. Okay. Um, Let's see here. Have have you used um, Propeller C in other courses as well? Well, we are currently using Propeller C to program balloon satellites that go up in April as well. And now we're doing these wearables. So I'm trying to figure out how to do that. That's one of those things that Parallax needs to make for me. Ah, okay. <laughs> which, which will be during the round table uh, right. section. Okay, very yeah. good. And then uh, next up, we have um, we have Mike, and uh, Mike is currently an associate professor at Great Bay Community College, 
uh, teaching information systems technology courses. Uh, he started out as a computer tech for the U.S. Navy and then got his uh, bachelor's in electrical engineering and has been doing engineering design and maintenance of early mainframes as a start and uh, for 25 years has been in product engineering, design and marketing uh, at, at all the different levels, and including product launch, uh, and also doing internal training uh, for companies like GTE Labs, Wang, uh, Cabletron, and Entrasys Networks. Uh, he then went to teaching, uh, starting as an adjunct professor at um, York Country Community College for 10 years. Um, and also at, uh, at the CTE Center in Sanford, Maine. Um, he's been active in the IEEE, uh, that's the Electronics Engineering um, Society Technology Committees and uh, has published and presented on papers at various trade shows and conferences. Uh, greetings, Mike, thanks for coming today. Yes, thank you for inviting me. Um, so, same questions for you. How did you get started with microcontrollers? Well, obviously, my history goes way back. So if the 8080 and Z80 count, they do. <laughs> I was certainly developing products and even teaching engineering groups how to do machine coding on those processors. Yes, that's something that is not happening as often these days. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, I do remember doing the hand assembly to the machine codes. And, yes. Um, yeah. Uh, and then as far as uh, parallax microcontrollers, when and where did you get started with those? Yeah, that would have been probably around 2008, 2007, 2008, somewhere back there. Okay. At that career tech center, which was high school level, mm -hmm. um, teaching the Cisco networking curriculum. I had students that had too many hours of free time and were bored and I I brought in the parallax and we just started doing projects with them. Whoa, that's really neat. So they were, so for part of the semester, they, they finished up all their router programming and stuff. And then they, yep. they get their A plus <laughs> certification. So they had their PC stuff behind them. And they and, got that out of the way and they're like, we're bored. <laughs> yes. So let's make some little robots and start doing projects. Oh, how interesting. So, so now we have a Wi-Fi module, so you can actually pop that right on to, the, um, to, to an activity bot and have it join a yes. network, which is kind of a, a cool possibility. So what courses are you teaching currently that are using uh, microcontrollers? Yeah, there's two primary courses I teach. It's the Applied Logic, and we start that one with a lot of basic Ohm's law and scaffolding up on safety of electricity so we can actually build circuits and not burn things up or hurt anything. Mm -hmm. And then as soon as we can, we get into the first few chapters of what's a microcontroller. And we knock out those chapters pretty quick because they've already got their Ohm's law behind them. They understand the resistors and diodes and transistors. And we've already done op amps also in the earlier weeks and start using the basic stamp in that course within probably the fifth or sixth week so that we're you know actually doing some coding generating signals um, i had a lab full of power supplies and signal generators and scopes and you know the basic stamp is my signal generator now and the, the power's built in so it's funny, it's mine too. So yes, I see here. So um, by the way, for everybody who's attending, um, if you open your chat window at the very beginning of the chat, uh, you'll be able to see a um, webinar college and beyond folder link. And you can actually go in and see um, any of the uh, pictures or in uh, Mike's case, the, uh, the course schedule. I believe this is it. Yeah, so here's where we have the Ohm's Law and all the electronics uh, leading up to logic. And then in the latter half, we're using the, it looks like you're using the basic stamp for a lot of the lessons. Yeah, for the applied logic, we exclusively use the stamp. It's in mobile systems development, which is a 200 level course that we use the propeller boards. Okay. And mostly I'm using the activity board. Okay. And as I mentioned earlier, 
um, when we were talking, it's the proto board or project board, propeller project board that students actually build their projects on. Okay, so which which one of the pictures here would be a good possibility for the uh, the project board you were talking about? Um, the game system is a good one. There we you go. Can see how someone can put a small screen. I think that's a one twenty eight by one twenty eight. Okay. And this was a student's prototype, so his final project, rather than the four switches, he has the joystick on there. Oh, okay. So he started out with this as the prototype and then switched from the buttons to the uh, joystick. Right. That he made, made another one, so I got to keep his prototype. Ah. And this board is relatively inexpensive compared to all the other boards, so I encourage students to you know, build right on the board and take it with them. I have a new one to show you, Mike. Wonderful. Uh, oh, actually, I think you probably know about it, but I'll make sure, I'll try to remind me to come back to this. And then I really like, uh, no, this is not the one that, that's. But that the, one's a good one where shows the capability of the, the board. You know, most micros don't give us 32 IO ports to play with. And when you set up a tic-tac-toe with all the different inputs, you need more than the 16 of the stamp. So that forces us into the propeller. Ah, yes, it does. And uh, yeah, I see. Yeah, I think it. I think it would be hard. You could probably have an expert, super expert, and then a you know, uh, ten megahertz and twenty megahertz expert <laughs> to play. It would be uh, interesting to see actually two of them playing against each other. Uh, where's the Altoids one? Oh, let's see. Did you show that? That's it. Yep. That was it right there. Oh, this one. My table full of toys getting ready. Okay. This one? Yes. That's okay. why I had them all, all lined up, all the traffic lights. Um, we're loading them, getting them ready for an outreach out to a high school. And that's one of the things that colleges have to do. You, you know, our Perkins grants are based on that. So you go out and show high schoolers a little bit about what you do in college. Yeah, and this is nice because we're not waiting for them to build the circuits. They can, you can just have them plugged into the boards and they can write a, a quick program and, and have a traffic light controller. Right, so I made these plug and play and I can do this as an hour of code at any high school. Nice. Okay, folks. So um, next up is reshare my screen and go to here. Okay, so um, so in terms of the part of the roundtable where we talk about what we have and, and what's new, um, go ahead and I, I'm just going to give everybody a, a quick bit of time to look at the screen. One of the things is that for community colleges, it so far we have not really found a particular course that every community college teaches, whereas at the high school level, um, there are some more common courses, and so we can be a little bit more uh, focused in a particular kit. Um, for the community colleges, often we've been doing custom kits where uh, maybe there's um, a robotics kit involved, and uh, maybe there's also um, you know, some, some sensors that are added to it. Um, and one school or even one class, as you probably heard, will use Propeller C or P Basic. Another class might use Blockly. And so there's, there's really been um, a lot of variation in terms of, uh, of what gets used. And so true, we do have a lot of different things in, in, in terms of uh, what we have textbooks and web tutorials for and, um, and what we offer in terms of, of kits and individual parts and microcontrollers and robots. And um, the reason there are more languages than this, but it seems like Blockly, PBasic and Propeller C have been the ones that have been most adopted by schools. So those are the ones I listed. Um, and then of course we have books, our learn site and, um, and then on our learn site, there are also assessment materials for teachers. 
Okay, so um, in terms of uh, more recent developments, Blockly Prop is something that we're really excited about. Uh, what it does is it offers a good 90 to 95% of what you can do in Propeller C. Uh, for example, um, well, uh, Blockly Prop makes use of the majority of the C language features. So if you have a particular sensor or motor or communication device that you want to work with, um, if you can work with it in C, you can work with it in Blockly and even have Blockly show you the C code it generated. Uh, and so it's, it's kind of a nice level of abstraction on the C language for, especially for classes as Jordan mentioned earlier, where um, you know, the onus of learning C programming might actually uh, take too much time uh, when there could be other robotics concepts that are core to that particular course. Um, in terms of hardware, uh, some of our recent developments, one is the propeller flip. Uh, and that's what I wanted to show you, Mike. So uh, this particular microcontroller uh, can either plug into um, a breadboard uh, or into a custom board and uh, it's nice because it's a fairly inexpensive module. I don't know if it's as inexpensive as the, uh, oh, it looks like it's currently $34.99. Um, so the it's- the total board is $29. Okay. Um, so for $5 more, um, it, it's true that this is $5 more, but um, I really like it. I think the design on this is, is excellent. Uh, all of the parts are underneath it. It does run uh, very well off of USB power and it is a, even has a little uh, warning light, which I'm pointing out right now uh, for if there's um, some kind of circuit mistake that was made, it will step in and prevent too much current from being drawn. Um, it's, it's a very nice little module. I know if I was in senior project all over again, I would definitely be uh, thinking about using this one for a project. Um, let's see here. Then um, other new developments, we now have the, uh, the, the badge. Uh, this particular badge has Wi-Fi on it. And so you can have uh, a number of them join networks and communicate with servers and get information, both sending in to and getting from. And then also, um, I just posted some code recently where they can communicate with each other as well. Uh, the ActivityBot 360. Um, anybody who has used the ActivityBot recently, or you know the the older version of our, of our ActivityBot, and then moved to this newer ActivityBot 360, uh, what you'll find out is that the calibration is a very seamless process. Uh, so it's it's easy to put together. The calibration is now much more simple, and um, and the uh, the servo wheels are more accurate, and it's easier to put together because in place of a, an encoder that was attached to the, uh, uh, behind the left and right wheel, um, the, uh, the angle sensor for the servo is actually built into it. And so that's, that's been a nice new development. And oh yeah, and here is the 360 servo uh, as a individual thing. Uh, here's the flip on um, a kit. So this is the, uh, this is the propeller flip try it kit. And that's where we've used the flip also is in the try it kit. Yes. And yes. it's nice where it's plug and play like that. You just pick up your power and IOs real quick. Well, and the lovely thing about the power on this is it's coming straight from the USB. And so you literally plug it in and it's ready to go. <laughs> yep. um, and then uh, I mentioned that there was another webinar going on uh, right now at Let's Robot TV, uh, the Parallaxy is being, uh, there, there's, a, uh, there's a, a build the parallaxy webinar. Uh, what the parallaxy is, is it's an activity bot with a nice big battery underneath it and um, also a Raspberry Pi. And the Raspberry Pi is joined to a network and it broadcasts what, it, what the parallaxy sees and hears. And there's actually a website you can go to called Let's Robot TV, uh, where you can, if, if somebody has a parallaxy, they can, they can have it join that website. And then people from around the world can uh, drive it around 
to uh, say push around garbage cans in the office or you know go to different parts of the office and, and meet various people um, in a virtual tour kind of way uh, and there's there's really a lot of uh, interesting things that that people can do and when they they, they can type in messages and then it will convert their text to speech and and say what they want to say and then they have little controls on the website where they drive it around uh, and then you can also speak back to it and they'll hear what you had to say and um, and again this is all uh, basically um, an extension of the ActivityBot 360 um, and we've actually been thinking that it, it has the potential for being an entire um, computer science curriculum in, in one robot um, we'll see how that pans out. I will just go to Let's Robot TV real quick. And um, so uh, here is some of the different robots that you could go to. Uh, this robot right here looks like uh, people are driving it around and they're having a chat. And these chats are moderated, but um, every once in a while, uh, people will say stuff that gets them either temporarily uh, disabled or banned. Um, and uh, this is a neat one. Um, basically, this is a uh, – the uh, the gentleman who did this is Roy Eltham, and he took the Parallaxy and instead made a, um, a, a Internet-controlled xylophone that you can play as as an as again an extension of the activity bot uh quite an elaborate one at that um, so uh so that's our new to, new basically what's new type of stuff and so now uh questions for our panelists what's working well in the classroom uh what can be improved or added um and that can be topics resources hardware or whatever else comes to mind and so uh jordan can we start with you Sure. All yeah. Right. So um, in terms of what's working well in the classroom, um, I, I really love the Blockly language um, because it really allows the students to focus on the core concepts of programming without getting caught up in the weeds of the syntax of, you know, making sure they've got the right number of open parentheses and closed parentheses and stuff like that. You can teach students about for loops and you, you just have them make a for loop and they just put a for loop block down and they can see that certain things are in that for loop and other things are, are outside of it. They can see exactly where it is and it's, it's really clear. Whereas if you had them programming um, from scratch, they would have to type in all the syntax. And um, I found that students who are brand new to programming often get frustrated by that. So, um, I, I really like the, the fact that um, students can come right in and, and get focused on the core concepts of programming right away. Um, and then that, that really frees them up to focus on, on the ideas about what they want their robots to do rather than, you know, getting stuck on, I, I wanted this loop to repeat, but now it, the compiler says it's broken and it's not doing anything. So, by, by allowing them to really focus on the ideas behind programming, they can, they can get started quickly and they can get their, their robots moving fast. Um, so Andy is showing a, a demonstration. Um, he just dropped down one block and you've got a for loop right there. Um, it's impossible to, to uh, forget to put in the, the end of the for loop or to screw up the syntax. I mean, it's really clear. You just see it right there on the screen. It says that it repeats whatever is inside there 10 times. I mean, people who've never seen a, a program before in their lives can look at that and, and understand that right away. So um, I really like that, especially since the class that I'm teaching in robotics is one semester long. Um, it Having a platform like this really lets students get started quickly and get to the meat of um, robotics while still learning the fundamental concepts that are um, the foundation for any program. Cool. Well, so um, also, what is is there anything that you'd like to add to that, or uh, would you like to talk about ideas that you have for improvements or additions? Um, I I think that you've done a, a fantastic job with it. Um, I 
I, I can't think of any um, improvements right now. Okay. Um, would you, is there anything you'd like to show us from your folder? Yeah. So um, one of the things that I really like to do with my students is have them work on open-ended projects. And, and this is kind of a, this is not a, a really long course. So, so one of the things I have them do is I have them uh, program sumo robot um, uh, competitors. So each student in my course programs their own sumo robot. They, they, this is the culmination of a semester long course. So they put different sensors to look for the edge of the sumo course on there. They have forward looking sensors to detect other robots in the ring and then they control motors to steer their robot towards the competitor and try and push them out. So this is a video of two of my students um, during the final competition. So they, the robots turn around and look for each other. And then when they do see another robot, they, they try and push it out. And the, the students are free to add on additional pieces. You can see one robot has little um, grippers that we're trying to, uh, to grip on to other competitors and things like that. Yeah, so, so I see a gripper here and was this a plow? And they, yeah, they, they did yeah, that. Yeah, printing. exactly. So, so students were free to, to write the program the way that they wanted and then free to add on extra components as well um, as they saw fit to, to try and win. All right, uh, let's see here. Did I share? Okay, I apparently closed that by accident. Okay, so Cindy, how about you? Um, same questions, what's, uh, what's working well? What would you like to see improved? Well, unlike Jordan, um, I don't have the luxury of being able to use the Blockly for the curriculum. I'm supposed to be actually teaching the language. Yes. Um, I have the, underneath my folder, Andy, if you could pull up, for example, the, the very bottom, oh, the underneath the links, under Cindy's links. Yes. So mm -hmm. is it in Cindy's links or is yeah, it? Yeah, the very, very end of the Cindy's links. Okay. Oops. And that's, that's actually one of my lessons. Yeah, sorry. I clicked okay. the wrong thing. Here we go. So toward the end, um, at the very bottom. Okay, so right there, the engi not engineering projects, but go up to Prop C course. The next Prop C course or the first one? The first one right there. Okay. Yes, I have to. So this is for the Colorado State um, Community College System. So they, these are guaranteed transfer so I use the Prop C for this course and they have to learn the language. So I'm using the Prop C and then I have another course that's for the P basic. So that works really well. I really appreciate all the educational material that Parallax puts out and I've gotten Andy to write chapters for me um, when we came up to something that did not, was not covered in his What's a Microcontroller with Prop C. Is that still in beta version? Uh, no, I think Prop C is, is now out of beta. And if I remember rightly, it was the use pointers. No, I mean the What's a Microcontroller <laughs> book. Oh, yes. The What's a Microcontroller book is still in a draft form. It's, it's through Chapter 9, almost done, but not okay. yet. So the educational material there is very helpful. Um, and the course material inside the books, if you could close that one and open up one of my lectures. Okay, one moment. In either language, it doesn't matter which one. So if you go, if you close that one and go back to the Google Drive. Got it. Just to my folder, okay. So go down to any one of those PDFs, those are my lectures. Okay. Um, September, this, that's a, uh, okay, so that's just homework going over homework, but then later on, if you scroll down a bit. Okay, so here's, we, I've used the pictures from the What's a Microcontroller draft, and then of course the electronics, and then I go through the programming and we can go step by step through each of the lines of code and diagram it. Yeah, and this is, this is something that we were hoping uh, instructors would do is is make use of the uh, 
the the illustrations and the pictures in whatever way they needed. So I'm glad to see you're taking these right out of the PDF and then uh, using them in your presentations and, and notes. And yeah. we even added something to the front of each textbook that, you know, hey, this is available to you for that purpose. Uh, and the, if you scroll down to the program, so this is a Propeller C. This is a first year class. I usually like to start them in P basic, but students can start in this class as well as, you know, with nothing prior. And then we, I can write in colors on my smart board and uh, take your program, except for I did type these in because they're prettier than color, uh, you know, cutting and pasting from the PDF because that was in black and white. So I did write my own programs and then, you know, paste it in there and then we can, I can diagram it. Um, so that part really works well for me. Yeah, and it looks very, very useful. Okay, anything that you'd like to see us, uh, any, any suggestions for things we might want to uh, consider or pursue? Oh, yes. Okay. Um, so I, I mentioned to you the, the second course in Colorado, um, the 161, a second prop C, which is really kind of C++. Okay. Um, but the other one is the, some of the sensors, it'd be nice to be able to buy, you have a little spot, uh, a sensor box, but it doesn't have all the sensors that you use in what's a microcontroller or the activity bot. So I pretty much cannibalize all my kits um, for a class. So okay. that it has, and it has enough LEDs, it has a compass, it has a ping, it has whiskers, it has push buttons. Um, they don't all come in one kit. <laughs> yeah, so that's, that's where the custom kit uh, might end up, that's either where a custom kit or uh, sometimes the refresher packs for the Bobot and what's a microcontroller. We have a, um, we have a refresher pack I can uh, have Kate uh, send out. I have, I have lots of those. Ah, good, good. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, let's see here. So next, oh, I see I2C chapter. Uh, well, yes, yeah. the I2C. Oh, I, I just noticed in, in our chats that there was um, uh, something about an I, I2C chapter, and I recently uh, added both master and slave I squared C to the propeller libraries. So very soon we'll be able to create an entire I squared C network of both masters and slaves with just a propeller that can be um, doing stuff. Sorry, I got a little bit distracted there because that was a... It, just happened to see that chat come through. Yeah. Um, so we'll- Very sad, huge. Yeah. Oh, thing. oh, cool. <laughs> um, all right, and then uh, let's see here. Mike, how about you? Yes, um, well, I guess my, my main thing that works well, of course, you know, the, all the sample code and stuff, not only in the books, but also in the compilers, you know, the helps are right there. So mm -hmm. love all that. The STEM initiative in New Hampshire has all of our high schools teaching Scratch, Scratch as a programming language. Yeah. So students coming to me and I offer them Blockly, which they just look at as an engineering level Scratch. Oh, I'd never heard it described in that way. That's, that's a pretty neat way to put it. Yeah, and now that you're adding you know, I2C and things like that, all the sensors I have, it's gonna be easy to code them up and get them running. So I have taken us over time and would like at least to give just a couple of people a chance to chime in from the, from the general attendee group. Uh, so quickly, anything to improve or add? Well, pneumatics, I'm sure you're going to get that for us sometime. Okay. Pressure sensors, things like that. And just as a tip for a lot of people out there to make your students successful, use a lot of well-knowns. My traffic light I use as a well-known. Everybody knows what it's supposed to do. One of my major assignments I give early on is make me a calculator. So I give them a two by 16 display, you know, two line display and a basic stamp and say, make a calculator. Four basic functions and they go off and program that. And again, everybody knows what it's supposed to do. So the challenge of coding is not that difficult. 
Okay. Um, yeah, and I will take that to heart because I'm working on a Blockly activity bot book right now. Yep. Um, awesome. Okay. And so then, Kate, do you have anybody with a raised hand that you want to jump in? Not at this time. No, we just have the comments in the chat window, which is really great. If you want to scan that. Okay. Uh, yes, let's go through here real quick. I'm scanning. Also call out if you, uh, so what your students, I don't know if, uh, uh, so for Ricky, these are all community college students in various uh, tech ed classes. Um, like, uh, at the bottom, a network module to make a sitter network ready, network module to make a sensor network ready was John Soper. Okay. Uh, all right. So on that, um, on that point, let's take a quick look at um, the WX module. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to search for the WX. And uh, so the badge is one. And then uh, this DIP WX module right here, uh, basically you can, uh, Let's see, let me go back real quick. So here's the top of it. There's uh, the actual radio module. And then here it is plugged into a propeller activity board. And uh, one thing that this allows in terms of being a network entity is that you can um, basically put sensors on uh, a prototyping area and then program the propeller to communicate with the Wi-Fi module. And then on the other end, you can, uh, this module also hosts uh, web pages. And so this is an example where somebody has gone to, uh, gotten on, uh, actually this thing's network, but it can either host its own network or it can be on another network. Um, and either way, you can get to this web page and, uh, you know, communicate with the robot and notice that there's control here, but there's also uh, distance um, down below. And, uh, and that's my phone, actually. <laughs> So, uh, so that's an example of, of networking. And let's see if- That's probably something people could use App Inventor for. Uh, App Inventor? Um, I'm not sure about that. What, uh, I, I mean, it's true that you could make an app and have it be doing similar things. Yes, I normally start with web pages because they're um, usually a little bit more approachable. And incidentally, we have, uh, tutorial series for this too. So if you go to learn.parallax.com, um, there's a whole set of uh, different web pages that you can create. So that might potentially be a step before actually creating the apps. But yes, I, I do believe that an app could also do the same thing, though I have not tried that yet. I, I actually have done a similar thing with App Inventor. Um, I wrote an app on my phone to control a a robot, but instead of you going through Wi-Fi, I went through the Bluetooth module. So my phone had a, a Bluetooth connection to the Parallax Bluetooth module, which then received communications from my app and then was able to control a robot that way. So I, yeah, that works. Okay, perfect. Now that was through a Bluetooth module though. I have not yes. tried it through the WX. I'm assuming yeah, that that should not. work too. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I have not tried it through the WX. Um, but yes, yes. So we know that it does work for robot control and it would be interesting to try to get it to connect. I mean, I'm assuming the only difference there is that instead of connecting through Bluetooth, you're just connecting over Wi-Fi and that yeah. it supports both. Yeah, yeah, I think so. That should be really fun. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, I'm going through the comments now. Are you people able to, uh, if I screen share, or well, go ahead and, and scroll through the comments and let me know if you guys see anything else. Would it be, on the pale, be beyond the pale of imagination to ever see individually networked sensors? Uh, working with Blackley Prop. Um, with I2C, we can definitely do that. We can daisy chain all of our sensors on the bus. Uh, yes, this is true. I mean, if we're not if we're not making a Wi-Fi network, if we're just making a network of sensors, um, you could certainly do it virtually with the uh, with the propeller. Um, 
having the propeller talking with the sensors and also functioning as an I squared C slave, and then maybe say a Raspberry Pi can be uh, also communicating with it. Um, individually networked sensors working with your um, let's see here. I squared C chapter. Yeah, uh, we're definitely thinking about that. We do have an I squared C chapter uh, request for gyro and accelerometer um, in propeller C and P basic. So the I squared C, uh, like I said, we can all now do master and slave with the propeller, both, both types of I squared C. You can have one processor doing one kind and another processor doing another. Um, and uh, so for those of you who want to try that, um, let me show you quickly where to go. It's not posted yet, but when it is posted, uh, learn.parallax.com, uh, basically tutorials, it's going to start in the language specific propeller C area. And uh, what you'll have to do is you'll have to go to the setup simple IDE part. Now, you may already have simple IDE. Otherwise, follow the instructions for your OS. And then after you're done, there's an update your learn folder. And that's going to take you off site uh, with some more instructions. And so these are uh, descending order. So um, the, the top is the most recent. And we're going to put one above here, and that's Andy, going to you, have. I don't see your screen. Oh, I'm so sorry. All yeah. right, let's share that. I hit yeah, share, yeah. but apparently I didn't hit the second share button. Ah, okay. ah goodness. Okay. There so, um, uh, let's see. I need to go back a tab or two. Okay. So, um, basically, at learn.parallax.com, you'll want to do. Uh, tutorials language specific propeller. Uh, now currently what we have is an I squared C tutorial and it's down in a section called simple protocols, but it's a very short uh, G here's how to talk to the I squared C bus um, on uh, your um, propeller activity board. So we're, we're talking with this chip with the propeller. Um, but more recently, we now have the ability to have both an I squared C master and then multiple I squared C cogs uh, running on the propeller. And so those I squared C cogs that are, are functioning as slaves can be on a bus and then the I squared C master, the propeller can say, hey, I squared C cog, what's the, what's the sensor reading? And then, hey, other I squared C cog, what is the other sensor reading that you're managing? And um, so what'll happen is, is you'll, uh, you'll go to the um, tutorials, language specific propeller C, and uh, it'll start in simple IDE, and I think Blockly will come later. Um, and so there's some, operating system versions of, of propeller C that or of uh, simple IDE for programming and propeller C that you can get and install. Uh, but then you'll also have to go to this update your learn folder link. And that'll take you off site and you'll be downloading a package that's going to appear here above these entries. It's not there yet, but it'll be coming soon. So, um, and then you'll be able to do both I squared C master and I squared C slave, and there will be example programs, uh, and they are already written, and they'll, they'll be inside the examples folder in here. Okay, so let's go back and take a look at any other questions. Let's see, and I know we're getting, we're, we just hit the one hour mark, which means I'm over time by 15 whole minutes. Sorry about that, Kate. Um, okay, so is there any other questions that anybody saw that? I do not see any more. Okay. Um, all right then, well, I'd like to thank all of you for coming today. Thanks to our panelists and thank you to our attendees.